So, I sort of missed the boat on a Game of the Year video. As many of you know, I typically do the snow globes in December, but, you know, it's February, it's close enough, right? Look, there are still several games that I would like to cover from last year, because 2021 had some really notable experiences. So, today, think of this as like an unofficial and slightly more freeform snow globes, because another aspect here is that I want to highlight games that I haven't yet covered on the channel. So, yeah, Yes, while Resident Evil Village and Inscription, for example, would definitely be Game of the Year contenders, I want to talk about why these other six titles were exceptionally memorable from last year. So hey, let's do it! Elekhead is nearly the pinnacle of simplistic puzzle platform design. It doesn't have a lot of moving parts, but the pieces it does have are used to the fullest extent, and the pieces themselves are so clever that almost every screen had me nodding my head in game design approval as I figured out the solution. You play as a robot whose head conducts electricity, which can, you know, move elevators, create walls of static energy, or build bridges as long as you keep the current flowing. And the major mechanic here is that you can throw your head to turn on conductors at a distance and move without your battery source for up to 10 seconds. So puzzles build as you continue, and things get beautifully complex as you figure out the less obvious gimmicks, like that you can activate two separate platforms if you straddle your legs across both, or that there's a delay when you throw your head so you can sort of get into place before something activates. It even utilizes the checkpoint system as a mechanic itself. I don't know if I've ever seen that before, but it resets the room when you walk over it. So again, there's just some really clever stuff going on here. You got collectibles, secrets to find, and almost zero fluff. Each screen is perfectly fine-tuned to flesh out the idea without overstaying its welcome. If you're interested in game design yourself, I feel like this is a must-play, just to see how good it feels to nail a concept so effortlessly. It's even complete with Easter eggs, like how if you accidentally land your head back on your body upside down, yeah, that's kind of just a fun thing, but if you finish the game with your head still like that, the credits themselves will be inverted as well. I mean, that's just... Mwah. I have less to say about Before Your Eyes than I do other games, but it deserves tremendous accolades for what it accomplishes with the unique mechanic of using your eyes as a controller. Yeah, you heard that right. You actually need like a webcam to play this game because it looks at your eyeballs and notices when you blink and uses that in the gameplay. If you haven't played it before, you're basically watching the life of the main character literally flash before your eyes, get it, every time you blink. So sometimes you'll want to keep seeing what happens in a scene, but involuntarily blink and it'll jump ahead into something else. Other times you'll have more control and you physically will decide to blink to move on, but in both of those cases, the scene itself is longer than you will see. So no matter what, you're only getting a snippet of the full picture and you have to piece it together as you go. It tells a heartbreaking story in a very charming way, and is worth experiencing alone just to see how far they take this mechanic of opening and closing your eyes as a means of progression. It gives a whole new meaning to reaction time, as you're literally fighting against your whole body to try and keep from blinking, and it's a good reminder that there still is a lot of unexplored territory within the game industry. Blue Fire may not be on a lot of people's Game of the Year lists, and I'd be lying if I said it was one of the best games I've ever played, but I do think it is a highly underrated one for what it offers. A Dark Souls-like world and combat combined with the fluid movement of Hat and Time sounds interesting, but I didn't expect it to be as addictingly fun as it was. Instead of feeling clumpy... <laughs> clumpy? Instead of feeling clunky and cumbersome as an intentional design choice like in a Souls game, being able to fly around and beat up hardy foes acrobatically opens up new possibilities for what that trope of punishing combat can actually look like. Like I said, it's not perfect, I actually ran into a glitch that hardlocked me in the first temple and I couldn't progress, but I was having such a good time that I was willing to restart the game and get back to where I was so I could go ahead and finish. Plus, I'm pretty sure they've worked out all those bugs by now, it's been out for a while, I played when it was like a pre-release build. There's plenty of secrets and hidden lore, the dungeons have a deep Zelda flavor, and there's even those little challenge rooms like from A Hat in Time as well. It just sets out to be a fun combination of experiences, and I think more people should give it a go. 
When I heard that Outer Wilds was getting DLC, I was skeptical that it'd be able to offer the same level of epiphanies I felt while playing through the base game. I, I mean, it truly is a once in a generation type experience if you haven't played Outer Wilds. Like, what are you doing, seriously? But by golly gosh darn, somehow they did it again. Echoes of the Eye has the same impacting moments, the learning bit by bit each time when you die, and somehow taking mechanics you already know and using them in ways to blow your mind again and again. There's a whole new world to explore, and from the first challenge of actually finding it to the final moments, it continues to drive forward the theming of player-led discovery and makes you go, what? You can do that? It's a hard game to talk about without giving away spoilers, so I'll conclude by noting that with the release of Echoes of the Eye, Mobius Digital has made it abundantly clear that their ability to create atmosphere and uncompromised freedom as a design concept is not just a fluke that they made one time by accident. Rather, they are the new developer to watch for any project they might have on the horizon, because it's clear that it'll be unlike anything else in the universe. I have a love-hate relationship with Metroid Dread. On one hand, it does a phenomenal job as a map former. See what I did there? Sidestep the whole Metroidvania naming debate altogether? Map former? It's the term of the future, I'm telling you. But the way it guides the player from objective to objective is more fluid than I've ever seen in the genre. You beat a boss or gain a new ability, and it spits you out right next to the new way to go. It's got a really big map to explore, but it doesn't really feel that way because of its level design, and that is truly refreshing. I, I thought backtracking was an essential part of the experience, but Dread proves that it can be a lot more streamlined. Now, on the other hand, the game sort of hit an annoying wall for me in the end game. When I went back and tried to collect all the power-ups so I could stand a better chance at the final boss, have you seen this guy? He's freaking tough. Normally, this is the part of the game where traversal is super quick and getting around is a breeze, but I kept finding dead ends or obstructions preventing me from getting where I wanted to go, and while yes, there is fast travel and teleporters, the loading screens are massive and got annoying quickly since it's really the only sensible way to get around in the end. For a game that did so much right in the first three quarters, it unfortunately left a bad taste in my mouth near the finale. Still a really awesome experience though, the movement and combat itself is some of the best I've ever seen in a Metroid game. And finally, let's talk about my unofficial slash official game of the year, Psychonauts 2. I was shocked at how much I loved this one because I tried out Psychonauts 1 and it didn't really click with me. The platforming was okay, but felt a little clunky by today's standards. And it sort of felt a little bit like a point and click adventure game at some points because of how you use the items you collect to unlock new pathways. Don't get me wrong, it had a lot of character, much like any other Tim Schafer joint, but I think I played it a decade too late. Psychonauts 2, however, not only fixed those elements, but created a compelling story that ties together an incredibly unique 3D platformer. The set pieces are so unbelievably vibrant and memorable. You'll go from a casino hospital, to a puppet cooking game show, to a bowling ball germ city. Heck, when the game reveals its big plot twist, it does so with an It's a Small World style Disneyland ride. Like, what game is this? But what stuck out to me the most was how it tied its narrative to its mechanics and combat. The whole game is about entering people's minds, so the enemies you fight are doubts, enablers, and judgment. And the collectibles you gather are nuggets of wisdom, emotional baggage, and a half a mind. Even the abilities you learn have purposes for all three elements. A new one here in the sequel is Mental Connection, and you use it to rewire a teacher's brain to let you go on a dangerous mission, but it can also let you reach new heights in platforming sections, and it's useful in combat as a way to bring enemies closer to you. The whole game is like this. You can slow things down with a deep breath, which also quells panic attacks. You can use clairvoyance to find secrets, including weak spots of enemies. And all of these come in handy as you progress the story and attempt to solve a mental mystery. It's a very smartly designed game that, based on its mired development cycle, has no right being as flawless as it truly is. The only thing left I wish I could do is live in Tim Schafer's mind for a day, just to see what the heck it's like in there. The dude's crazy. I can't recommend Psychonauts 2 enough, as well as the rest of the games on this list. 2021 ended up being a pretty good year for gaming, all things considered. And I wanted to thank you as well for sticking around with me because it's been quite the ride. I hope you have an incredible 2022, and I just want you to know how much I love you. So I'll see you next time, and stay frosty, my friends. Hey.